Well, today we continue, although we are getting close to our conclusion, which will be next week, in our series on The Wizard of Oz. And in this lesson series, I hope that you have been rewriting this story for your own inner life. You see, in Unity, as I worked with applicants recently at Unity Village who were applying for the ministerial program, and for the first time I had the pleasure of interviewing them and working with them and guiding them into the program, a question kept coming up, and our admissions committee had a little bit of a challenge, and that was whether all of these applicants were, were well-versed in what we call, in unity, metaphysical interpretation. Usually metaphysical interpretation of the scriptures, of the Bible, it can be of other uh, holy teachings, but we can also apply the principles of metaphysical interpretation to something like the Wizard of Oz, and that's what I have attempted to do without using that term metaphysical interpretation. But it means looking at that story and seeing the process, the truth, the principle that Dorothy's discovering in her journey on the yellow brick road, seeing how it is true of your inner life if you choose to look, of course. So a metaphysical interpretation is to see the story as your story. What can I learn from this? How can I see this process of discovery told in this great American fairy tale or legend how can I see this as revealing an inner process within me? That's the only value in it. Otherwise, it's simply entertainment. And that's fun. Generations have read it for entertainment. But there's a lot more to it than that. In our adventure so far, we've looked at a number of things. We began just as Dorothy the Gale of Kansas began. You know our neighbors to the west. She began in a rather bleak environment or landscape. Our author, Frank Baum, described Kansas as gray, gray, gray. I'm not sure Kansans appreciate that, but this was the beginning of the story. And in that bleakness which every individual may experience in life. I've had my bleak moments. I've been in places that seemed rather bleak and dreary from my perspective. And a longing can come up in the soul, a longing that Dorothy in the great 1939 musical, of course, launched into a song that is still one of the most beloved around the world. Anywhere you go, you might hear it sung. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I've heard about once in a lullaby. And it goes on yearning for a realm of all possibility a realm where trouble and harm and fear and worry and anxiety melt away like lemon drops. And where all possibilities can come into expression. So through this imagination, Dorothy, like we, can move our awareness, our mindfulness, our focus away from the bleakness and the hopelessness, a land that I fear personally the most, the land of hopelessness, and lift through this longing to a marvelous land 
for Frank Baum, it was the marvelous land of Oz, a place of possibility. And as I told you, he used his spiritual studies in what was called the Theosophical Society of his day to guide him in unfolding these characters. What might be possible in this realm of possibility? Dorothy found herself through life's strange happenings to be taken there by a tornado to a land she had never never heard of and had only dreamed of. We can meet in this new realm, as she did, companions, helpers along the way. And so she met those companions we know so well. Oh, well, they were on the screen a while ago. Don't worry. We have them in our mind's eye. The Scarecrow, the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion. They were characters through which Dorothy learned her own possibilities on their adventures on the yellow brick road. Thank you. She learned through the scarecrow, who according to the story had no brains at all. So you see there's a little riddle in this. He didn't think he had wisdom, but what happened? He proved in how he led the group through many trials that he was the smartest one of all of them. He proved this inner capacity of wisdom of thought by thinking, not by talking about it, by thinking, by doing, by practicing. And, of course, we had the example of the Tin Man, and he thought that as the tinsmith created him, and that's a long story in itself, but as the tinsmith created him, he forgot to put in what? A heart. So the tin man thought himself incapable of feeling. But as the story unfolds, he's the most compassionate one in the group. Why? Because he practiced compassion concern for others, helping Dorothy and the others on their way. And then there was the cowardly lion who was afraid of his own shadow, so to speak. And yet, he was supposed to be king of the forest. But by stepping out and being the leader of the group in terms of boldness, and willingness to do what needed to be done, through practice, he discovered he was the most courageous of the group. So each one found in experience what they thought they lacked. So now today we come to a new point in the story, and you may think, I'm nitpicking, that I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. But it's a very important lesson. And so I'm just going to read to you the description as Baum gives it. Now you know from the movie if you've seen it, the books if you've read it, or someone certainly told you the story, that Dorothy and her companions, after many trials and encounter encounters with the Wicked Witch of the West, she and the three make it to the Emerald City to have their first audience with the great Wizard of Oz. And of course, they were seeking the wizard for his power to give them what they were craving or what they desired. So as Dorothy approaches this fearsome presence, this great spectacle. It was described at this point in the book as a great 
hairless head. I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you and why do you seek me? It was not such an awful voice as she, has, as she had expected to come from a big head. So she took courage, and she answered, I am Dorothy, the small and the meek. I have come to you for help. The eyes looked at her thoughtfully for a full minute. Then the voice said, Where did you get those silver shoes? I got them from the wicked witch of the east when my house fell on her and killed her, she replied. Where did you get that mark upon your forehead, continued the voice? That is where the good witch of the north kissed me when she bade me goodbye and sent me on my quest. Again the eyes looked at her sharply, and they saw she was telling the truth. Then Oz asked, What do you wish me to do for you? Send me back to Kansas, where my Aunt Em and Uncle Henry are, she answered. I don't like your, co I don't like your country, although it is so beautiful, and I am sure Aunt Em will be dreadfully worried over my being away so long. The eyes winked three times, and then they turned up to the ceiling and down to the floor and rolled around so queerly that they seemed to see every part of the room. And at last they looked at Dorothy again. Why should I do this for you? asked Oz. Because you are strong and I am weak. Because you are a great wizard and I am but a helpless little girl. But you were strong enough to kill the wicked witch of the east, said Oz. Why, that just happened, returned Dorothy. I couldn't help it. Well, said the head, I will give you my answer. You have no right to expect me to send you back to Kansas unless you do something for me in return. In this country... Everyone must pay for everything he gets. If you wish me to use my magic power to send you home again, you must do something for me first. Help me, and I will help you. What must I do, the little girl asked. Kill the wicked witch of the West, answered Oz. But I cannot, exclaimed Dorothy, greatly surprised. You killed the witch of the east, and you wear the silver shoes which bear a powerful charm. There is now but one wicked witch left in all this land, and when you can tell me she is dead, I will send you back to Kansas, and not before. Well, it seems to me, reading that story, that it uh, sounds like quite a commercial exchange or barter, sort of a you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. But in truth, it really expresses a much greater principle. It suggests the task that life gives each of us. If we remember, Jesus declared to his people it is the Father's good pleasure to give you his kingdom. But as throughout the Gospels, it's always important to see what comes before that. Jesus said, seek first the Father's kingdom and goodness, and then all you need will be given to you. In other words, the creative task of seeking comes before the supply is given. In unity, we teach that we are all co-creators with the great creator God. But what does this really mean? I don't feel on some days much like a co-creator of the mountains and the oceans and the wonders of the world. Do you? The teaching is more fundamental 
more basic than that. God is principle, the structure, the matrix of the universe. I like to think of principle somewhat like a great cosmic instruction manual. As co-creators, we use the divine instructions in order to create. And there is our life task to be responsible co-creators. We have a necessary part to play in the creative process. We have our unique job to do. Just as the wizard gave Dorothy a specific task to accomplish before she could receive his help to take her back to the earthly realm of Kansas, he gave her a commission. And so we have a commission too. Each one of us, each in our, our own way, is constantly creating by using the principles that in unity we call spiritual principles or the truths of God. We're using one right now, this month, in our offertory blessing, a little short one, I was looking for a short one, from Charles Fillmore, that says everything we praise increases. Even modern psychology. Since I was in a doctoral program of psychology, I feel that I can speak to this. Psychology recognizes this principle that what we praise, give thanks for, or you might say focus your attention upon, grows. It increases. And that can work either way. You can praise the friendships in your life, and I can assure you, they will grow in terms of attracting others into your life. They'll grow in terms of, why, James is mighty nice to be around. People will want, they'll be drawn to you like the old Unity song goes, love is a magnet that draws to me. But that praising or that focusing attention can also be focused on the negative, the great symbol of the wicked witch of the West. We can focus on fear and anxiety, challenges, lacks, problems, that's a good word, problems in our life. And what do we do? We simply increase the anxiety. We don't accomplish anything constructive. We just build up the worry and the anxiety. I've done it, so I know somebody here has done it as well. Emphasized the problem, the negative, and done nothing constructive. There's a wonderful proverb that's a good one to remember. A little gem of wisdom that the power of life and death is in the tongue. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Remember that. Commit it to memory if you don't already know it. For it teaches you this fundamental perspective of unity that with our words, we what? We build up or we tear down. The power to kill, or excuse me, the power of life and death is just a dramatic way of saying building up or tearing down. That is in the power of your word. So being a co-creator with God is not so much creating the Rocky Mountains, creating the magnificent, magnificent Lake of the Ozarks, although we do give thanks for those long ago that created this lake for us by using what? Nature, God's principles, they dammed up the water to create this marvelous lake. But I'm talking about what we face, each one of us, in each day. 
in each opportunity, in each counter encounter with another human being, regardless of who it is, family, friend, stranger, you have the opportunity to bring something that builds up to that encounter or you can make matters worse. You'll really do one or the other. There are not very many of us that walk around as an inert presence in the world. We're all doing something. We're building up or we're tearing down. We do it through our words, and our words shape our actions. They result in how we treat one another and the things that we do in the world. So that helps me to just think, I'm always doing something. So I must choose. What will help this situation? What will make it better? Or, to be honest with myself, am I intent on tearing down this relationship or the circumstance? We can use this power to cleanse away problems and difficulties. Isn't that what Dorothy did with that symbol of a bucket of water? And she cast it upon the wicked witch who simply melted away. Why? Because she had no reality in herself. She was just a figment of fear, hatred, and harm all rolled into one. So when we look, we may ask ourselves, what is mine to do? What is my task? And if we think, well, I don't have much to offer, we might remember this quote from the famous cultural anthropologist Margaret Mead, very well known for this truism. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. The activated, activated individual brings change, progress to our world. Now, one of my favorite short stories is that of Riddle Steiner. A student came to him and said, Dr. Steiner, tell me what to do in order to be happy. And Dr. Steiner stopped and said, perhaps the question you can ask yourself is, what is my task? For happiness and fulfillment in any life comes from fulfilling meaningful work, fulfilling an opportunity, or to put it very simply, the happy individual is the individual that knows they truly make a difference in their world, in their church, in their community. That's what makes a happy heart, to know that you make a difference. In summary, as Unity students, we always begin with prayer. If we're considering this life task, what has, what has life given me to do? What is my unique task? We begin with the process of prayer, as in all things. Why? Because it's just our tradition? No, because it makes sense. It works. We begin with our spiritual practice in order that we can go within and as we did last week, we deny or let go or cleanse ourselves from a sense of fear and anxiety and helplessness. And we build up our sense of what we truly are. God's creation. 
How many times in this church or another Unity Church have you heard, Jan, you're a child of God? Well, they're not just words. They express an idea. This is God's unique creation. No one like it. There's no one like Jan. Thank God, yes. Yes. Think about those words. It is important that we begin the process with this inner awareness of what we are as God's creation. For the child has the capacity of its parents. God is creator, and we are co-creators in this world. Secondly, the process of prayer is to seek guidance on what is ours to do. If we are willing to turn within, if we are willing to set aside our fears and concerns, and we are willing to affirm what we are as God's creation, as God's good work in this world, and then we're willing to wait in the silence, as the little girl said, well, I sat in the chapel a long time in silence because I wanted to wait and see if God had anything to say after she had said her prayers. If we will wait in that silence, the Spirit of Truth will reveal our task, what is ours to do. Remember when I read the Psalms this morning, there's that recurring theme that God answers, that God provides. If you will truly seek that guidance, the answer will be given. You will see what yours is to do to make the world a better place right where you are to do your part. Someone asked me recently, in all honesty, which I th think is a good place to start, and that is with all of the great problems that seem to be coming up in our world at this time, does the positivity, the happy thoughts of unity, are they really up to the task? That's up to you. The reason that we affirm these truths, the reason that we take this positive approach to life, is so that we can find our task, what is ours to do, and do it. Yes, it may seem like a small step. It may be a small thing to you to do your best to be kind, to others right here in Sunrise Beach. But that's a beginning. You're adding to the warmth and the kindness of the world. Yes, we're facing great challenges. But humanity has faced challenges throughout the centuries and the millennia. The wars just aren't new now. The cruelty between human beings didn't just start last week. It's a process of this experience on earth. But again, return to the power and life that is in your tongue, that is in your word, extended into your actions. You're always creating. Do you wish to help the situation or hinder it? Do you wish to build up or tear down? Do you wish to be a peacemaker or one who brings violence and harm to the world? These are the choices we each make, beginning within our heart and then how we choose to express this in the world.
This is completing the task that life has given to each one of us, to be wise co-creators with God. God has established the principles of creation, how things unfold, how things work. Now it is for each of us to take up that divine instruction manual, those principles of life, and work them. Or as my friend Jackie says, knit them into something beautiful. We're all knitting one way or the other, weaving together these creative principles, and they become our dress, our mood. They become our quality in the world. Choose wisely. I invite you to take this opportunity now to turn within as we affirm this possibility. In our practice, we begin by affirming the truth of our Creator. That there is one presence and one power, God the Good, omnipotence, that is all power, that this one presence is in our life and in the universe, a creative principle that we call into our actions, into our choices, into our decisions, to make our work good. to work toward the good of all. We can also affirm, like those that worked in the Theosophical Movement, this statement, the law of good shall stand in my life and in my world. This is our foundation. That the goodness of God is more powerful than any error, any fear, any violence that human beings can engender. Now acknowledging the power that God has placed in his children as co-creators. We ask Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, to help us inwardly discern what is ours to do. You may hear that voice inwardly saying, How may I help? How can I make a difference? What is mine to do? And we now rest in the silence, knowing that it is the promise of the Spirit of Truth to always bring enlightenment. to bring insight, an indication of what ours is to do on this path of life. So we rest in the silence and in the presence of our God. Almighty God, we give thanks For the Christ light, the impulse for good that you have placed within our heart. Is now our choice 
to take this impulse into our outer activity, into our world, and do what we each can to make this world a better place. And for this task of life, we say hallelujah and amen.